I want to start my talk entitled Hidden Traces of Early Europeans in the Remains of a Drowned Forest. So this is going to be focusing on Cape Sable Island. And I know there's some people on the call who uh, are not familiar with that. So just to put it in context, it's at the southernmost tip of Nova Scotia. Now, it can be confused with Sable Island, which is a completely different island in a completely different place. And so just to be clear, Sable Island is the place you might have heard of that has the sand dunes and the ponies. That's not what we're talking about tonight. Tonight we're talking about Cape Sable Island and it's a, it's a much um, more civilized uh, and uh, modern island with people living on it and uh, um, roads and buildings. Uh, so, it's now you can drive to it uh, as of uh, August of 5th, 1949. Before that, you had to take a ferry. And in particular, tonight we're talking about a part of Cape Sable Island called the Hawk, which is uh, a very beautiful, interesting place to visit. I'm going to zoom in on these, um, these era satellite imagery showing the complexity of, of the uh, beachfront area there and zoom into the hawk itself. Now the, the area that I investigated um, covers the shaded zone that I'm indicating. So I'm focusing really on this part of it, which is where all the interesting stuff is. And it's about a kilometer in width along that stretch. Now these uh, satellite images, you can find them on regular Google Maps, but I'm using a program called Google Earth Pro, and there are some advantages to that. For one thing, is you can go back in time and look at older aerial or, uh, satellite imagery and choose uh, imagery that uh, maybe was taken when the conditions were better. So for, for this one, you, if you can see my cursor, um, the current imagery isn't that great. I mean, it's just kind of blotchy. You don't see a whole lot in, in the tidal zone. So by using this feature of Google Earth Pro, we can go back and look at other sets of imagery that maybe look a little better. Um, so this current one is dated uh, 2020. It's the most recent one that's up on Google Maps. If you want to download Google Earth Pro yourself to try this, uh, if you just um, go on your browser and type in this, download Google Earth Pro, you'll come up with this kind of a Google uh, uh, search uh, result. It's best to avoid the things at the front that talk about ads and so on, but if you go down to a link that actually has the word Google in it, you're going to get uh, more directly into the uh, uh, supplier of this software, which is Google and you'll get it with a page that sort of looks like this. You can just install Google Earth Pro or, or look at the system requirements, and it's really quick. Um, I just did it a few minutes ago uh, just to double check that it, you know, works the way I think it does, and uh, I got a new version installed in about five minutes, so uh, this, it's really quite handy. Anyway, uh, getting back to the matter at hand, so this is an example of imagery from 2018. And you can see that now a lot of the features along the shore show up much better in, in this image. Um, and here's another one from 2016. And again, you know, the, 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 the features look different. Some of them, um, you can see, this is a particularly uh, important feature, which is a, a cobbled berm that looks just like a road. I think it's a natural feature, as far as I can tell. Um, but um, but it's amazing when you're there how much it looks like a, a road that's built up. Anyway, um, so there's all these different patterns that appear in the satellite imagery. And the question is, what do they correspond to in real life? Well, I'm going backwards. So um, here's a better image. I'm zooming in a little bit now. You can see there that what looks like sort of light green is really just sand tinted by the, the seawater. And then what's uh, more of a uh, light brown is um, a 
exposed areas of, of rock covered with seaweed for the most part. And then you have this darker green area, which is uh, thicker seaweed over top of the rocks. Now, there's the down forest is located in these areas too. Like the, it's mostly in these darker green areas. And we'll be looking more at that. Here's another uh, image from 2014. And so again, you know, different lighting, different tide levels, um, and and different uh, filters, maybe even on the on the imagery, uh, produce uh, um, different views of of what's happening there. So it's great to uh, what I did is I, I took a trip down there and uh, investigated it in person, and then you know based upon what I saw, I can now relate it to the satellite imagery. So my trip uh, I did last July, and I was motivated by the fact that it was an extreme low tide, and they only happen a few times a year, and uh, this one was particularly low. So I thought maybe it would expose uh, additional features that are even at regular low tide you can't see. But I had to leave the house at 3 a.m. It's a three-hour drive uh, for me to get there. So by the time I got there, which is almost exactly at the extreme low tide event, the sun was just rising. It was quite nice. Uh, but uh, this was one of the first uh, views that I had of, of the uh, Hawk area at extreme low tide. Normally you, you see some of this, but not to such a great extent. So you really see the drowned forest. Uh, it, fairly clearly with these. Uh, these are all stumps of trees that were formerly growing there and are now just sort of relics. Um, there's, the roots are still there. This is another photo taken uh, from somebody else uh, at an earlier time and it's a little bit more clear. This was before a lot of the seaweed uh, had a chance to develop and so uh, you can see the wood a little more clearly and the roots. So uh, what's happening is that these, um, these stumps are washing out of the sand. As the sand erodes away, it exposes, it exposes new stumps. And here is a shot I took at sunrise that morning uh, with, with uh, some of the stumps only just emerging fairly high up on the beach. And the, the other ones are further down the beach. They were, they um, emerged out of the sand at an earlier date. And so there's kind of a progression, like as, um, as they emerge from the sand, uh, they eventually get covered in seaweed, but for a while they're fairly clean. And so as the sand uh, keeps um, changing and you know more sand being washed out to sea and it exposes more of these uh, forests, but at the same time, at the other end, they're they're being lost. The stumps are being eventually lost, but to erosion. So here's a close up of some of the newer stumps that are emerging, and here's a close up of one of the older ones. So you can see they're um, uh, fairly intact. I mean, these are pieces of wood. They're they're not like fossils at all, uh, and they they were growing in that actual spot um, fifteen hundred years ago. So even the roots themselves are still in a version of the original soil. So it's the uh, rising sea level that kills the trees. So technically you don't call them fossils, but they can be called a subfossil because a true fossil is, is stone. Here's a shot showing the peat mass um, that in this case, there's no roots in it, but a lot of the times the, um, the stumps are rooted in this uh, material. And so this is original, basically it's original soil from more than 1500 years ago that um, maybe has been modified a bit from being under water now, but um, still, you know, it's, it basically is the original soil. And you can see that the, the soil lies on top of a cobbled beach. Um, so, it, uh, it's only like a foot or so thick in, 
you know, I'm sure it varies, but um, on the exposed edge, it seemed to be about a foot thick. This meter stick is marked off in uh, 10 centimeter segments. So three of these segments is one foot, approximately. So this shows a particularly clean area of the peat where there aren't very many trees, uh, roots, stumps. And uh, that was particularly striking to me because it contrasts with um, other areas, you know, of course, uh, where, where they're very densely populated, like here. And so, you know, it was unusual, I thought it was unusual to find um, a stretch that really had, had no stumps in it at all. And it made me think, was this stretch cleared at, at one time? Like, if the forest was growing all around it, why wouldn't the forest actually be growing here unless maybe somebody had cleared the forest away? I don't know. It's just a question mark, really. Anyway, uh, one of the most interesting things about this place is that as the uh, sands um, are washed away, they reveal, in addition to the drowned forest stumps, they reveal obvious constructions that were uh, made by humans at some point in the past. And uh, then eventually they were covered up by the sand, you know, the, the motions of the uh, uh, sand as, as it moves around from place to place, covered them up. And now it's uncovering them again. It's, that's a normal sort of uh, shorefront process as um, just the, the natural forces move uh, sand uh, dunes around and, and beaches change location and Sable Island itself, the other Sable Island is, is actually moving all the time due to this kind of a process. But anyway, here's, here's a very interesting uh, shot that was taken in 2010. So that's like uh, 12 years ago um, of these posts that are emerging from the, the seabed essentially as the sand recedes. And there, do, there are some stones that have been sort of lodged against them. So it's a combination of, of posts and stones really. Um, here's another example from 2016. And one of the striking things about the structure is that it's in such a straight line. Um, now there's actually two straight lines and you can see a couple of posts from the other, uh, the other linear feature of posts that are showing up here. Um, today, when I was there last summer, there wasn't very much of this one left, but because it was extreme low tide, I was able to see more posts from this feature over here. And also um, somewhere around here, there's a stone structure that in 2016 wasn't really obvious at all. But in the 12 years that passed, a lot of the sand has eroded away and exposed some stones basically around here somewhere. So this is a shot that I took last summer and it's um, of that uh, lower alignment that I was mentioning that's visible at extreme low tide. So there's my meter stick. And here you see several posts in the line that are being exposed. Why are they there? We don't really know. What do they represent? If I did take a close up of one of these, you can see that there are clear ax marks on it. Uh, so it's not just, you know, these were made with metal tools. There's no doubt about it. It's a very sharp steel ax that would have um, made cuts like this. And uh, I'm just showing one example, but there, there's several examples that were clear to see. And here's another one. This is one of the posts that uh, eventually eroded out of the sand and it's just lying flat in, in nearby. Um, and again, you can see the ax marks that uh, were made to uh, make it pointy in order to drive it into the sand in the first place. And here's another close up of one of the posts. And so you can clearly see that a metal auger was used to uh, drill out these holes. Um, the, uh, the post is, you know, weathered quite a bit and, and worn out. 
uh, so there's a lot of, I mean, there, it was probably taller in the past, and this was just another round hole like this one. And so as time goes on, this hole down here will eventually look eroded like this one does. So these things are, uh, you know, uh, they don't last very long. They're being exposed to the severe elements and uh, being destroyed. Here's a shot of that U-shaped stone structure that I found. Uh, so this is a shot I took last July, and it's fairly well defined now. Um, and this arm of the U, it looks quite a lot like the stones were placed in some kind of a trench. So was this part of the wall uh, of a foundation, maybe that was meant to be like a boathouse, so open on this end to the to the water, uh, and a foundation uh, laid down, or was this some kind of a drain that um, you know the stones were there to um, to provide drainage? I really don't know, but it's just interesting how you know these things are becoming um, easier to see for a while as the sand uh, exposes them, but as time goes on, they're also being destroyed by the wave action. And, and uh, this is the same um, structure from a slightly different angle. Um, I put my meter stick at the other end. This is actually quite long and it can be deceptive because here the meter stick is at the near this pole. This is the one that I photographed a minute ago with the ax marks in it. Um, and it, it doesn't look like it goes very far back, but if you look at how much smaller the meter stick looks here, um, you can see that this is quite elongated. So it's, it's a narrow rectangle, really. The perspective is a little tricky. And there's that stick that had the ax marks in it. Here's another shot of it as well. Um, and again, you can see that it really does look there's been, that there have been some manipulations of these these boulders. I mean, a lot of them are natural, but um, to be placed in a trench like this, and similarly on that side, and you know, there's like a clear edge where the the natural boulders seem to be missing over here. Um, so it's very complicated what's going on, and there's also sort of a mound almost, or what's left of it. Is that the remains of um, a sod wall, maybe, that, that fell over? Um, it seems to be paralleled a little bit on this side. I mean, there's been a lot of erosion, so it's really hard to, um, to speculate as to what these features originally looked like. So here's a shot from just four years ago when this U-shaped structure was beginning to emerge from the sand. There's still the upper part of it is still uh, quite a bit of sand on it, but the lower part has has been exposed. But the um, there's only you know there's fewer stones in it uh, then than there is now because more have been exposed. But I think some of them have also been moved away. So it almost looks like the, the, these wall-like features were taller four years ago. And, and they've been kind of flattened by wave action, which, which would make sense because the, the sand was probably holding them uh, sort of in place. And as the sand is eroded out, then the boulders become more subject to uh, wave action to actually move them off the feature. So getting back now to the, uh, the first uh, set of posts that emerged, uh, here's a shot from 2018, and you can see that uh, a lot of these posts are in pairs, and even triples, really, because they seem like they have um, fairly well-defined pairs, and in some cases, even dowels that, that cross between the two uprights. And also, sometimes a third uh, post on the right here kind of associated with it, too although those don't seem to have survived as long. So, you know, it's, uh, it's very complex. Uh, you can note how they line up with the lighthouse. I mean, I, that's nothing to do with the lighthouse. I just stood in a place that made them line up that way. Um, although the line does, you know, doesn't line that way. But I, this is a shot that I took 
yeah, this one's not my shot. Oh, sorry. The one on the left is not my shot, but the one on the right is. And I tried to get basically the same shot lined up with the lighthouse. Uh, and you can see there's quite a lot of differences, really, um, in, uh, in how things lie. Um, so hard to believe it's even the same place. Uh, but uh, so in those four years, you know, the, the wave action has really moved things around a lot. And, and we are definitely losing parts of the structure as time goes on. So, so this is facing, this is a shot I took facing uh, basically south towards the lighthouse. And if I turn myself around and face the other way, um, you can see what's left of the, uh, of the structure going that way. And uh, so th there are quite a lot of posts, but not as many, obviously, as in that first picture that I showed when the feature first emerged, when the posts were almost like one after the other in a picket fence. Um, so uh, the deeper ones, I guess, have lasted longer, maybe. Okay, so um, we're back to the drowned forest again, and you can see that um, there's uh, just posts and stumps everywhere. I mean, these are all natural. But notice what I found here where I placed my meter stick, something else unusual. It looks like a piece of brick. And this particular piece of brick is um, sort of caught up in the roots of, of this uh, tree um, stump. I don't know if, you know, the wave actions have driven this piece of brick to be lodged in the roots or it, if the roots actually grew over it, probably not. More likely the waves pushed it there. Um, so I didn't touch that one. There were a few like that that I saw that looked like they were brick. I mean, they were not a, a whole brick, but pieces of brick. But, you know, it looked like they had um, originally been part of a full brick at one time. Here's a close-up of one that, uh, again, is, seems to be lodged in the roots. Of course, if they weren't lodged in the roots, they would be, you know, moved around quite easily by the wave action and quite likely drawn out to sea, along with the other loose sediments that are usually drawn out to sea. I mean, this is an erosional beach, so things are being washed out to sea all the time. Um, so I scoured the area quite thoroughly. I was, I was looking very carefully, moving very slowly, going back over things um, repeatedly. And then I spotted this little thing here. This caught my attention because I was on the lookout for red ceramic tile. I'd heard that some had been found in the past. And um, so this was the only example that I saw. If there were other examples to be seen, you know, I'd be surprised because I really looked very carefully. And this is the only one that I spotted. So I did a close up of it and um, I, I brought it home with me. Um, and uh, it, it does look like a um, a piece of ceramic tile because there's this um, lip on it that um, it's like a fold almost and um, so it you know it's it's flat apart from this lip that folds up in, along a, a straight fold so it, immediately I thought it must be one of these infamous pieces of red roofing tile that have been described uh, from the area. So I happen to be talking to Laird Niven about finding this and uh, he mentioned that he had also similarly collected a number of such pieces from that location. He generously offered his services and that of his colleague Emma Culligan to analyze this ceramic item. So they operate a laboratory for artifact analysis as part of the Oak Island Interpretive Center. And in fact, a new archaeology lab building is to be attached as a new wing of the Interpretive Center in 2023, this summer. 
So most people on the call are probably quite familiar with Laird. Uh, he's one of the top professional archaeologists currently working in Nova Scotia. Um, Emma Culligan is uh, employed at the Oak Island uh, Interpretive Centre and she has a degree from uh, Memorial and she's studied both archaeology and engineering. So this is a shot of their interpretive centre and uh, they're, they're quite proud of it. They um, feel it's one of the best uh, labs for artifact analysis um, in Eastern Canada and um, has quite a lot of gear. Um, this item on, on the left is a micro XRF. And this over here is a powder XRD for analyzing powder. And uh, in the back, they have a micro CD CT scanner, which uses x-rays to um, essentially analyze the interior and slices of, uh, of an artifact in there. So it's pretty advanced gear. So as a result of Emma's analysis, she gave me the uh, composition of this tile. And she also compared the composition to uh, bricks that uh, they actually had on hand that were found in a historical context on Oak Island, just to use as a uh, cross-reference. Um, so the the ones on Oak Island are similar to local soil, so they probably were made locally. So the tile uh, has uh, unusually high phosphorus and sulfur and magnesium content. And the fact that it had been immersed in salt water was evident from the analysis. Uh, now, she also analyzed uh, clay that was collected on Oak Island. And uh, so the, there was clearly differences between the composition of the local clays and the uh, analysis of the tile. So she was fairly confident in saying that this tile must have been manufactured outside of southwestern Nova Scotia. She also did an XRF scan, um, and uh, so she highlighted sulfur and uh, phosphorus as uh, two of the uh, interesting uh, chemicals that were spotted there. And uh, so comparing the um, the chemical analysis of the uh, tile that I picked up, which is here highlighted in yellow, and uh, with the other uh, bricks that were found on Oak Island, as well as the soil on Oak Island, you can see how uh, the presence of sulfur and phosphorus are true outliers. I mean, there's they're not even present at all in the, the local samples. But on other things, you know, there's differences as well, like the magnesium um, and uh, uh, calcium is a bit higher and so on. So it seems fairly evident that this sample came from somewhere far away. Okay, I think I've mentioned these things. Right. So we said that. So here's uh, here's showing some of that information in a graphical uh, format, where the uh, um, potassium line is uh, highlighted and the sulfur chlorine is coming from the salt water. So these are the lines. All right, so you get the brick is this one, this color. My ceramic tile is the blue. And the soil is, I think, this lower one. 
anyway, so there are some similarities and there are some differences, I guess, is basically what it boils down to. Um, yeah, I guess these lumps, these, these lumps in this color are the uh, tile that I picked up and they're not present in the other, in the other uh, lines. So that's the bottom line. Um, where did this tile come from? And uh, what are all the other, how do we explain the posts? Um, really, there's no answers right now. I know um, uh, there was an archeologist who did some work um, uh, and some uh, test pits in the uh, beach area. Um, I want to say William Campbell. I know his last name is Campbell, but it's, I'm not sure about his first name now. I thought I knew that. I I would uh, I should have written it down. But um, yeah, so he his conclusion really was that there was some kind of a, a fishing stage that had been built there, and that the posts were um, you know had been covered up by the sand at some point in the historical period, and that they're they're in no way associated with the drowned forest. Uh, so that might be the case. Um, the the posts, you know, seem to have a pattern that's a bit different from what I would expect for fishing stages, like for uh, processing uh, catch and uh, drying fish and so on. But I think there's still, you know, a opportunity for further analysis and, uh, uh, you know, more investigation. So really, I I don't pretend to have the answers. What happened? I, I wanted to go out and check it out. I went down on one day and uh, took up, took up, took the opportunity of a low tide event to um, to investigate the site and you know make some document it to the extent that I could and um, and then we you know thanks to Laird and Emma we did an analyze that um, that ceramic artifact. So it all points to you know something that really should be um, given more attention and um, a lot more further analysis. And really time is of the essence as well, because as is apparent, you know, the erosional processes are, uh, um, you know, washing away the evidence very quickly. And it's not gonna last much longer. In fact, I would say more than half of it has already disappeared. Maybe uh, closer to 80% of it has already disappeared. So although new features keep showing up as, as the sands expose them, um, then they are subsequently eroded away. So um, it would be great if we could uh, somehow get a proper project down there to fully analyze what uh, what's going on. So really that's it for me and I'm really happy to answer any questions or hear, hear anybody else's uh, opinions or uh, you know findings as well. Thanks a lot, Terry. Appreciate it. Um, I, I don't know if you can look up in the top right corner there, the participant thing. I think there's a couple people that would pump that uh, got bumped out there. Um, they'd probably be interested to get back in um, for the question period. Uh, if you can't see that, I can reclaim host for a moment to let them in. Okay. No, I sorry. I I, I should have been up on that. Um, no, you're doing your presentation. That uh, very you're, you're focused on your things, which is very fine. Um, okay, I think I've admitted them all now. Great. All right. Perfect. So, uh, folks, um, I'm sure there's there's questions for Terry here. So, if you do have questions, uh, could you? Uh, put your hand, your virtual hand up, and we can uh, um, get you on that way, or you can post your questions in the chat, and we'll try and address them that way. I see John Campbell is on the chat. He's the man I was trying to remember his name. Yeah, John Campbell. So he's online. He could probably, um, you know, offer uh, his his own, uh, uh, you know, point of view and having studied the same area. Is John here? Interesting. You might want to unmute him if he wants to have something to say. I just don't even see his name here. Uh, 
I think I think we were just posting John's name that he's not actually maybe in the. Oh oh, somebody said John Cavill. Yeah, okay. You yeah, right. yeah, yeah. Not- my mistake. My mistake. <laughs> That's okay. That would be great. Uh, um, Uh, so yeah, so if you have questions, feel free to post them into the chat or put your hand up. I'm trying to so uh, have it so I can see people. Share. All right, well, maybe I'll just go through some of the questions that are in the chat then. Um, so uh, let's see. Somebody mentions here that Cape Sable Island is the tallest lighthouse in Nova Scotia. At uh, 30.8 meters or 101 feet tall. Interesting. Yeah, um, that's pretty impressive. So I guess uh, not necessarily a question, but interesting. Um, it is a registered site there at the Hawk, a registered oh. archaeological protected site, which is great. But yeah. as you pointed out, um, there's obvious issues with uh, erosion there. And that, that's a, a general concern um for all of nova scotia unfortunately that a lot of we're losing a lot of our sites quite quickly uh, i don't know if you were able to, uh, you showed a lot of good uh, images there from from um maybe a decade ago it, did you see obvious uh evidence of erosion there yes for sure and, and i know it's, it's commented on by john campbell during his his study at the time and i think uh, i believe wesley was there if you're looking to talk to someone oh. that uh, that I think I believe Wesley had uh, helped out with some of the uh, photography, the uh, drone imagery, and that kind of thing uh, at the time. And I'm sorry, Wesley, if that's underscoping your role in that uh, that study. Um, but uh, he did mention that this dendrochronology has been undertaken with some of the posts there that date to the um, 17th and 18th century, which is uh, very interesting. Wesley says he helped with mapping and surveying on the site, but didn't get back for the excavation. Um, so we have radiocarbon dating was undertaken uh, for the several of the posts. Yeah, and and I think John was going to uh, attempt dendrochronology on the posts as well, but um, I'm not sure that that came back or, you know, I haven't seen any results from that. But yeah, so that was what the results were for through John Campbell's study was that yeah, um, yeah, seventeenth and eighteenth century. Right. Yeah. So there's a couple of questions here. I can I, I can read them off for you if that's helpful to you, um, Terry. They're starting to flood in. <laughs> so yeah, go ahead. To... Go ahead. Sure. Um, so Bill Moss from Quebec City, you mentioned early dates in the abstract. What elements have been dated and what are those dates? So that's maybe something similar to what we were just uh, chatting about um, with with dendrochronology that has been undertaken there and, and then the, the uh, studies the uh, the assessments that you've most recently uh, undertaken with the the folks uh, at the um, new lab. Yeah, well, the the dates I referenced were um, fifteen hundred years ago, and and that was based on carbon fourteen on the actual stumps. So, I guess you have two uh, completely different things here at this co-located with each other. You have the the stumps that are that are fifteen hundred years old. Uh, and then you have the posts that that are much more recent than that. Uh, so there's other things going on there too. And so um, I don't think it's necessarily limited to just those two things. You know, the historical posts from um, 16th or 17th century and the drowned forest stumps from you know roughly 500 AD. Um, You've you've got that entire time span. There, there's not necessarily only those two things there. So that's that's what makes it interesting, I think, to to try yeah. to tangle the whole mix of uh, uh, features there. You're right. It's a great representation of a possible um, uh, landscape that has been used for since time immemorial. That uh, that uh, have possibly been used because it was a great landscape uh, for. Um, subsistence in the area that had been used from uh, the Mi'kmaq all the way up to the modern historic period um, until it had been uh, taken over by water and erosion. So it's one of those great that are many and sad story that there's so many sites like this that are starting to erode pretty pretty dramatically throughout the 
province. Uh, we have a comment here from Linda saying this is the 100th anniversary of the construction of the current lighthouse. The original one was built in 1861 and was shorter and needed to be replaced. Interesting tidbit there. Um, Samantha says uh, they have a number of photos from the 2005 from 2005 in the Cape Sable Historic Society collection, but can't post them here because of restrictions. But uh, that would be interesting. Maybe we could follow up uh, with uh, with that to some time for uh, additional photos. So, has uh, anyone who knows about fish weirs and fish traps had a look at the post patterns? There are fishers still in the Fundy area who would still be familiar with the trap fishing in this area. Well. I think people have, and it, they've been puzzled by it. That's been my, you know, um, uh, understanding is that um, it seems like there, the um, fishing weir or fishing stage explanation seems like such a good fit in many ways, but the the actual layout of the posts and so on um doesn't seem to match with with expectations although you know so so yeah it's I, I think people have but but they're i don't think they're able to quite figure it out yeah i, th I think you're right um for sure i think it's been uh, been uh, taken into consideration but not not uh decisive conclusions and i think the most recent studies that have been done there uh, under permit have been more work is required. And I think, Terry, you could probably agree with that, that uh, there's a further study required and, and sooner rather than later before it completely erodes. Wesley mentions that the peat also dated to uh, approximately 1200 uh, BP, which is okay. interesting. Um, um, so there's uh, another question from Matt, uh, Matt Moore, Terry, will there be any clues on old, on any old maps as what have, may, what may have been there? I'm sure you looked at lots of old maps on this one, Terry. Yeah, and uh, so that's a part of Nova Scotia that um, the mapping um, doesn't help very much um, because you know it's basically a, a dot on the map. You know, Cape Sable was referred to in some of the very earliest maps, so we do have a. Uh, you know, maps that identify it as a, as a place of interest, you may as well say, um, but they are not of a high enough resolution to, you know, to show an occupation or a building or uh, anything like that. Like, so, so we know Cape Sable was a place people identified and, uh, and thought was important enough to give it a name and probably went there. Um, but what did they do there and, and did they build anything there or no maps that I know of have that information, but, but yeah, that, it does show up. Cape Sable is like on a lot of maps. Right. So Linda states that, yeah. Something's there, but what is it? So that that is that is the uh, the pertinent question, and then unfortunately that happens a lot with archaeological assessments uh, throughout the province. We can we can record what's there, but not, not necessarily we can we can interpret things as best to what the evidence is. But sometimes it's difficult to actually uh, pin it down to one specific thing. As as Terry pointed out, this is obviously an area that's been used for a very long time, over and over again. So I should, before I forget, is thank Linda for having helped me uh, access the site and learn about it. And also uh, Laird and Emma for doing that analysis and, uh, you know, lots of other people. I, I shamelessly borrowed uh, photos from the Facebook group uh, and I uh, really appreciate the folks that have put them up there because, um, you know, there is a Facebook group which I uh, uh, also posted my uh, lecture uh, announcement on. So um if people have an interest they they can go to that facebook group which uh, linda is uh, um you know keeps keeps going so great information there dave david jones uh asks will this be on the elk island show no <laughs> <laughs> i think you knew the answer to that one already um any 
<laughs> we want our own show, Linda. <laughs> yeah. um, someone uh, named iPhone uh, asks, any evidence in the archival records or land grants? Again, I'm assuming you've... you've uh, Look. Linda might be able to talk to that. I, I haven't gone that far into it, but maybe she has. Can we unmute her? And to speak up if you want to be unmuted. <laughs> I got to try and find you here. Samantha is better to ask, says Linda. She's more familiar with land grants. And Samantha says, not that we have seen, no. So it doesn't seem like it. Again, those are pretty uh, similar to the uh, mapping for that area, pretty broad and not uh, necessarily specifically showing. Um, it may show grants, but not necessarily any structures uh, on the grant maps. Paul says, I recently, sorry, I lost it already. I recently moved to Cape Sable Island and I find it odd that there are no historical traces of Charles Latour or the early French presence on the island? Are there archaeological records of which I am unaware? Well, of, of, there is the, uh, obviously, the Latour site um, not very far away. And so um, Katie Coutreau Robbins has been doing an incredible job of uh, documenting that site. And, you know, digs have been happening there uh, several years in, in a row. And it's not that far away. I don't know, uh, oh, 10 kilometers or something like that, I guess. So um, while she was down there, I know, you know, John Campbell was working with her and he sort of took an interest in the, the Hawk uh, work sort of as an adjunct to what he was doing with Katie at Fort Latour. So um, yeah, if you, if you Google Fort Latour, um, you'll probably be able to bring up the work that Katie and her group have been doing. And it's, uh, you know, it's quite remarkable the progress they've made there. Yeah, the Nova Scotia Museum actually has some great blog posts directly from the work that's been done there, um, uh, which I, again, I know there's some, several people uh, watching right now that have been part of that uh, that, that uh, excavation over the years as well. And uh, Linda says, as far as we know, there's no record of any structure in the area during this time period. So yeah. what we have is the physical remains of uh, structures, but not necessarily um, information to tell us what it is at this point, as far as the archival information. Any further questions? We'll give it a couple more here if, uh, if there are, but uh, I can, I'm sure I can speak for everyone, but by thanking you, Terry, uh, very interesting work. And I, I know it uh, takes a keen passion to get up at 3 a.m. to get uh, to target a low tide that only occurs a couple times a year to uh, to find uh, and document something of uh, of interest to you. So uh, we definitely certainly appreciate it. Well, if we have a second, I can tell you a funny story. It wasn't really that funny, actually, because I got bit by something while I was there. I mean, things were jumping around and buzzing around and I had long sleeves on and, you know, I don't usually bother with that kind of stuff. I'm oblivious to it, but something bit me. I don't know what it was. It bit me right through my shirt on my on my forearm, and I brushed it off. Um, but whatever it did to me <laughs> identifies as Lyme disease. Like I don't think it is Lyme disease, but it's a the it, it bit me with some kind of a bacterium in its in its juice that. Uh, essentially gave me what is diagnosed as Lyme disease. And so I was out of commission for Goodness. quite a few weeks after, uh, shortly after that, uh, that day uh, at the Hawk, um, had to be on antibiotics for, for a while. And, you know, I'm, eventually I was fine, but. Uh, well, putting, putting your health on the line for our. Yeah, yeah that's right. <laughs> um, Terry, you mentioned the road looking structure. Do you really think there's no chance it's man-made? Yeah, I don't think so. I wouldn't have any purpose there. And it, it is a type of structure that does form under these conditions of wave action and, um, you know, hydrological uh, forces along along a shore. And we, you see them in other areas. It's basically a gravel berm. It's just the fact that it's kind of perpendicular to the shoreline at that spot. You know, obviously there was some complex uh, actions, that, uh, you know, that uh, when it formed compared to what they are today, I mean, 
there may have been a um, some kind of a uh, uh, glacial deposit, you know, of till that that was shifting the direction that the that the currents and the erosions were happening, and then and now that's not there, and so it, you know it's sort of a a ghost of uh, former morphology. You know, we just don't know uh, really all the details. At least I don't. But uh, maybe someone who does this for a living, you know, would be able to make sense of it. Yeah, fair enough. Um, so uh, Matt Moore just mentions that there's photos of a map in a Facebook group called Historical Stories of Nova Scotia. The title of the post is 1871 History and Geography of Nova Scotia. At Cable, Cape Sable Island, there's a note on the map that seems to read round frames of rocks. So very interesting and possibly uh, a follow up um, option uh, with for, for further research. Um, and up the harbor says uh, they can send you the picture of the drone face on Facebook if you want. So maybe we can set up a connection later. Um, feel free up the harbor to send us an email to the um, or on, on any of our social medias. If you don't have Terry, uh, Terry's direct information, we'll get you in contact there. Um, yeah, another thing to note is that it's really the southernmost tip of Nova Scotia for so for people who were coming, let's say from Europe and uh, coasting along the Atlantic coast of Nova Scotia, really, you know, before they really knew what what the place was all about, um, you would get to this place, and all of a sudden the coastline no longer runs, you know, south, west, um, or northeast. It's it's a whole different ball game. And so it's it's like the transition, really. I mean. It transitions into the Gulf of Maine and and the uh, Bay of Fundy ultimately, but uh, so it's it's kind of a major node, if you will, uh, in the in the um, geography of uh, of the area. Certainly, yeah, very interesting uh, area and understudied. There are several um, registered archaeological sites on Cape Sable Island, but uh, but certainly there's it's it's. Uh, understudied portion of the, the province for sure. Um, we have a cross promotion here for following the Barrington Museum Facebook uh, complex Facebook page, which I do know has had a great hand in, in helping out with quite a bit of archaeology in that area, uh, which is wonderful, particularly at uh, uh, with uh, with the Nova Scotia Museum at Port La Tour. Yeah, and I th th that's right. I mean, there's a lot of people uh, like that who have you know, been at this and trying to uh, bring this to public attention for a lot longer than than I have. And so uh, I'm really a newcomer to this. And I just thought it was important that I maybe raise the profile a little bit since I had the audience and uh, just try to let more people know about what's going on in, in particular since it, it is being lost so so quickly due to erosion that, you know, it really needs more attention. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll leave it with one final message here from Samantha saying that they are co-applicants with the province for a lot of archaeology based initiatives. So stay, stay tuned for some good news in the next couple of months. So that's that's really great to hear because um, um, especially with these coastal projects that uh, they're not going to be around uh, for for very much longer. So um, we'll try and record them while they are here. So that's great. Again, thanks a lot, Terry. We appreciate it.